going back to the very beginnings. This was really, you know, the place to be. By gunsmith John Dowd in Goshen, Connecticut. <laughs> so he died in March. The people who raised me named me Louisa, pronounced by many as Luisa. When I was older, I changed my name. I am Icy Palmer. My parents and I were Tuscarora Indians, members of a migrating tribe that had begun their journey north from the Carolinas in the early 1700s. They eventually separated and settled in both Western New York and Ontario as the sixth nation of the Iroquois Confederacy. I was born in September 1824 in a sugar house just south of here at what is now the Equinox Valley Nursery. My parents were facing an upcoming winter and a continuation of their arduous trek to Canada with a newborn and made the difficult decision to give me the best chance for survival by leaving me with people in Manchester. My first years were spent with the G.S. Purdy family whose home wasn't far from the sugar house after which I was moved from there into town to live with Mr. W.P. Black and his family. Mr. Black is also a resident of Delwood. As I grew, I worked in local homes doing whatever chores and jobs they needed done. In my 30s, I moved into a small cabin that was provided to me by the Hard family on River Road in the upper pasture of their farm. For the 1860 census, they included me as a member of the household. I had great fondness for them, and one Christmas, some years later, I gifted Mr. Willis C. Hard with a Bible I'd inscribed. After I left there, the Ladies Benevolent Society of Manchester's Congregational Church gave me a small house at the head of River Road, which allowed me to continue living an independent life. I was most comfortable being outdoors and wandered the roads and walked through town every day, no matter the weather. I'd walk for miles collecting butternuts and kindling made into a bundle that I'd draw home at day's end. I had no fear of the weather. Neither the summer's heat nor the fiercest winter conditions kept me in when I wanted to be out. Sometimes while out walking, I'd learn about a family that was stressed by illness or death. I'd appear at their door and would stay to help out. I'd cook, clean, garden, care for their children anything that was needed to get them through their, their difficult time. When they were back on their feet, I'd quietly move on. I was beloved by many in the community, but they found me mysterious. Throughout adulthood, I was primarily supported by local benefactors in the form of food, clothing, and a small annual stipend, and was considered Manchester's number one welfare case for over 80 years. I'd been taught to read, received religious training, and was devout as an adult, but hadn't received any formal education. As an Indian, I wasn't allowed to go to school with the white children, but I watched, listened, and developed skills on my own. In addition, I learned a great deal from the town's young people who taught me about life in Manchester and the ways of civilization from year to year. As a result, I possessed an extensive fund of knowledge and information. On my own, I'd found ways to earn money. I sold maple sugared butternuts and candles. I made all my candles. And each evening at dusk, in a ritual of enchantment and protection, I would burn two of them that burned until dawn. Summer tourists bought my woven baskets and I was a noted fortune teller praised for my accuracy. Robert Todd Lincoln often had me tell his fortune, as did the wealthy guests at the Equinox Hotel. With my earnings, I had fully intended to repay the Ladies Benevolent Society for their generosity through the years, and had specified in my will that any money left over would go to them. I continued living independently until 1909, when some townspeople began to notice strange behavior on my part. At well over 80, my mind was beginning to fail, and I no longer made wise decisions about my well-being. 
When I was found wandering the roads one winter day dressed in my summer clothes, they were concerned about my mental health. My condition had become such that it was considered advisable by those who had my best interests at heart to place me in the Brattleboro retreat for the remainder of my life. Two town selectmen escorted me there on February 3rd, 1909. The retreat was founded in 1834 and was the first facility for the care of the mentally ill in Vermont. I found it to be a sumptuous place and spent my days in comfort and contentment. Others who lived there expressed interest in hearing about my life. I told them that I'd had a twin sister who went to Canada with our parents and that we were direct descendants of the great Incas. Two and a half years after my move to Brattleboro, on July 9th, 1911, a Sunday evening, I died peacefully in my sleep. My obituary in the Manchester Journal concluded with, indeed, a landmark of the town has fallen. Although I had been taken in and provided for by many in the community, I was never regarded as an equal member of society. I was assisted, but not accepted. In my youth, when I worked for and waited on families, I wasn't allowed a room in their homes. Rather, I slept in their barns. If I passed anyone, if, if people encountered me when I was walking the roads, I would turn my back and bow my head until they passed. Even, or especially, at the end of my life, their non-acceptance was evident. A funeral service was held for me at the First Congregational Church, but since I was an Indian, I wasn't allowed inside the church. Instead, my service was held in an adjoining chamber. Despite my humble, gentle, and quiet demeanor, I would considered my legacy. I was fiercely proud of my heritage and wanted to be remembered for my contributions to the people of Manchester. All of my money-making endeavors had allowed me to lay away a bit. After my death, and to the surprise of many, it was discovered that I'd already purchased my plot in Headstone here at Delwood. A wandering nomad all my life, I wanted a home at the end. There will always be much about me no one will ever know. Perhaps my most enduring gift to all of you is my mystery, and that is what makes me so unforgettable.